Welcome. Welcome, everyone. On behalf, on behalf of the director, Susan Weber, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here to the Leon Levy Foundation Lectures in Jewish Material Culture with generous support from the David Berg Foundation. Let me begin by introducing tonight's speaker. Andrea Berlin currently occupies the James R. Wiseman Chair in Classical Archaeology at Boston University. She had previously held the Morse Alumni Distinguished Teaching Professor of Archaeology in the Department of Classical and Near Eastern Studies at the University of Minnesota. She has a BA in Classical and Near Eastern Studies from the University of Michigan, an MA from the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, and a PhD from the Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology from the University of Michigan. While a student, she was staff archaeologist at the Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago and was senior archaeologist and director of the Dulles Airport Archaeology Project in Washington, D.C. As she reminded us last week, those of you parking in the gold parking lot are sitting on top of her work. She has published a volume on the Persian, Hellenistic, and Roman plain wares found at Tel Anafa in the Upper Galilee of northern Israel and co-edited another volume on the First Jewish Revolt. She has published on Koptos in Egypt, on the pottery of the Second Temple period found at the first, uh, at the second, first century site at Gamla. And in 2012, she brought out the second volume of her work on the Tel Anafa site, devoted to the glass vessels, lamps, objects of metal, and ground stone and other stone tools and vessels. <clears throat> More broadly, she has written about the Phoenicians in Hellenistic Palestine, about evidence for cooking in Second Temple Judea, ceramic typology from Hellenistic Lower Egypt, on the limits of Romanization of the Galilee, on the administrative center at Tel Kadesh in the period of Persian dominion. Like last week, and like next week, Professor Berlin's lecture will be followed by a comment, tonight provided by Karen B. Stern. A fuller presentation of her response will come tomorrow at lunchtime for those interested in more. Professor Stern is assistant professor at Brooklyn College, where she works across the disciplines of archaeology, history, and religion. She is the author of Inscribing Devotion and Death, Archaeological Evidence for Jewish Populations of North Africa, published by Brill in 2008. And she has been writing over the past few years a series of articles on inscriptions and writing, in particular graffiti, in Hebrew or by Jews in antiquity and late antiquity, ranging from North uh, African sites to those in the Syrian desert. But we'll hear more about her work tomorrow. In last week's lecture, Professor Berlin introduced us to the eclectic landscape of Hellenistic southern Syria, Judea, Idumea, and northern Egypt, to Jews, Syrians, Sumerians, Nabataeans, Idumeans, and Egyptians, to Hebrew, Greek, Samaritan, Nabataean scripts, to amphorae and stone jugs, Ionic columns, and mikvahs. I won't attempt to summarize the lecture. She may do that much more elegantly in a few moments. But I will underline the methodological point that she subtly deployed, that objects boldly go where no surviving text is around to take us. These lectures are a reminder, as they were intended to be, and as Ludwig Blau foretold nearly a century ago, that a landscape full of things is even richer than one that is only full of words. Professor Berlin. Oh, hello, my goodness, look at this crowd. You guys are great. So good to be here. Let's get started. In the early second century CE, the Roman historian Tacitus finished a chronicle of the tumultuous years between the death of the Emperor Nero in 69 and that of Domitian in 96. One of his big set pieces is the conquest of Jerusalem, which ended Jewish efforts to hold together an independent state. 
It may have seemed to Tacitus that his readers would find improbable the idea that a small, militarily inconsequential people would have such lofty aspirations. So, just before describing the future Emperor Titus's siege and eventual capture and destruction of the city, Tacitus steps back and says, as I am about to relate the last days of a famous city, it seems appropriate to throw some light on its origins. He discusses then the origins of the Jewish people, their early relations with the Egyptians, their beliefs, their rituals, and then he writes, while the East was under the sway of the Assyrians, the Medes, and the Persians, Jews were subject to tribes. When the Macedonians became supreme, King Antiochus strove to introduce Greek civilization, but was prevented by his war with the Parthians, for at this time the revolt of Arsaces had taken place. The Macedonian power was now weak, while the Parthian had not yet reached its full strength. And as the Romans were still far off, the Jews chose kings for themselves. Tacitus is speaking of the end of the second century BCE, the point where we ended last week. In this famous assessment, he gets one aspect right and another one wrong. He gets right that this is a significant moment politically it is the moment when the Jews became, in addition to a people and a culture, what today we would call a polity, with their autonomy recognized and their own head of state. He gets wrong how it actually worked, although considering that he was an outsider writing 200 years later, we may excuse him. In fact, oh, what's this? What should I do? option. Thank you, Peter. Have you had a chance to admire this map? <laughs> now you will. So you see Parthia, you see Rome, you see lots of green, and then you see the little bit of purple. That's what we're talking about. Okay. So, uh, yes, in fact, the Jews did not choose their kings. Those with the title, first Aristobulus and then his brother, Alexander Janaeus, claimed it for themselves. And there is much historical evidence to show that there were many who did not support them. A careful read of the narrative written to justify their claims, namely 1 Maccabees, reveals repeatedly contested incidents of accession, including Simon's willingness to have Jonathan, his brother, and Jonathan's sons, his nephews, put to death, Simon's own murder at the hands of his son-in-law, his sons John Hyrcanus' loss of Jerusalem to the Seleucid king Antiochus VII, and the constant presence of powerful rivals who sought positions of their own and needed to be outmaneuvered. In other words, the dynastic saga of 1 Maccabees, notwithstanding the ambitions and internecine struggles of the Judean kings, were Hellenistic politics, as usual. The Hasmoneans were Hellenistic kings, albeit ones who controlled only a tiny bit of territory. It is worth noting how last week's final snapshots support this characterization, which derives from historical sources. The elaborate burial monument at Modi'in, the palatial compound at Jericho, and the destructions that allowed for territorial expansion. A fourth set of material remains are coins, small bronzes. John Hyrcanus is the first to mint them, and his son Aristobulus is the first to put the title of king on them, a practice that his brother Alexander Janaeus continues. Janaeus's coins name him king in both Greek and Hebrew, a message that he amplifies with symbols of the Seleucid royal house, most commonly the anchor. This is the claim of kingship that Tacitus is referring to. Last week we ended with a divide that we could see on the ground. This week we'll follow what happens in the next 100 years. Material remains will again be our baseline. Their changing character and distribution 
our signposts. Such remains show us ground level behavior. And because they are firmly situated in time and space, they anchor that behavior to specific moments and venues. As last week, again I ask, what is at stake here? What can we glean from examining the physical remains of these years? The answer, or at least my answer, is that the remains of the first century BCE are signposts of what I call the revolt's prehistory. That prehistory begins with the divide that appears in the later second and early first centuries BCE, but that divide is not enough. If that was the case, revolt would have occurred much sooner than it did. But that divide is the starting point for three developments over the course of the first century BCE. The first, under the Hasmoneans, the home becomes a political space, making it possible to identify political affiliation by household goods. Second, the independent Hasmonean kingdom is lost, and in its place is a book, a book that offers a particular premise and guide, a kind of script for regaining the land. The third development is the entanglement of the Jewish aristocracy, and especially the priests, in the same cosmopolitan lifestyle that Herod promoted. We will track these three developments by focusing on three generational moments. Ooh, I think I was supposed to be showing you that while, you were, while I was just talking. That is nice, but I'm going to change the slide now. <laughs> What is it? This is um, the inside of a house at Gamla on the left, and then uh, a map showing the various destructions of the um, Hasmonean state towards the end of the second century BC. And there's the book. <laughs> and now we're caught up. Uh, the first of these generational moments begins toward the end of the rule of Alexander Janaeus and continues into the joint rule of his sons, Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II, so from around 85 to 63 BCE. The second, from around 40 to 37, a generation later, encompasses a clash between their successors. The third is one generation further on in the final years of Herod's reign. Let me say a word about this generational approach. I have borrowed it from the sociologists, and I have found it useful even, or perhaps especially, when transferred to the deep past. It reminds me to grant each generation the reality of their times. It slows history down to a human pace one in which specific events create the context for people's attitudes and choices, and which in turn become the context in which the next generation comes of age and acts. Historical writing can flatten out the social landscape. Thinking in generations helps restore some of the bumps. Moment one, Janaeus and Sons. Alexander Janaeus becomes king in the year 103 BCE. He inherits a territory that includes Idumea, Judea, Samaria, and Perea across the Jordan. Only five years earlier, his father had attacked the cosmopolitan town of Nyssa, ancient Beth Shan, just across the river from Gadara. The complete destruction of Nyssa has been dramatically affirmed by archaeological evidence. If we follow Josephus, Janaeus spent almost all of his reign attempting to expand the territory he inherited. He began with an attack on the coastal city of Ptolemaeus, the next largest harbor south of Tyre, which failed. He managed to take Gaza after a year-long siege, thus finally gaining a sizable Mediterranean port. He repeatedly attacked cities across the Jordan, including Gadara. 
What do the cities targeted first by Hyrcanus and later Janaeus have in common? Most, obviously, are Mediterranean-oriented with residents like Meliager of Gadara, who would have seen themselves as citizens of the world. But there is a disquieting exception, the temple city of Mount Gerizim. The archaeological evidence demonstrates unequivocally what happened here in 108 BCE. The sanctuary was targeted and all signs of its support demolished. Barely a single inscription survives intact. Most were hacked into pieces so small that little sense can be made of them. Considering that these inscriptions were on large, solid, heavy pieces of limestone, that of Deliah, whose we saw last time, is two meters long, the phrase targeted destruction seems appropriate. What exactly is being destroyed? Most of the inscriptions are in Hebrew, some even in the script of ancient Hebrew. Often the god named by the dedicant is Yahweh, the same Yahweh who had a temple in Jerusalem. The sanctuary had been in place for over 200 years. There is no evidence that the people who lived and worshiped here sought to expand their domain. In fact, as we saw last week, the most common phrase invoked in the dedicatory inscriptions in this place points to a sanctity that was unmovable. The destruction of the sanctuary on Mount Gerizim demonstrates a policy of violence and coercion. When we put this event in dialogue with other evidence, material and textual, we can see the intent to establish a hierocracy, a temple state, with the king as both political and cultic leader. The historian Benedict Eckert calls this the Hasmonean strategy of legitimization of rulership. Its components include the insistence on Jerusalem as the sole religious center for Jews, its exclusive sanctity unique and unchallenged. The recasting of the temple tax from a payment owed once in one's life to an annual obligation. New interpretations of halakha, Jewish ritual law. The crafting of a foundation story that situates the Hasmoneans within the arc of biblical history and casts their valor as heroically unique. An approach that the historian of religion, Brent Nongbri, characterizes as a reinvention of Judaism and the invention of new festivals and new rituals and their assertive linkage to the Hasmonean party. Of these very substantial interventions, the middle three depend on close readings of first and second Maccabees, Josephus, commentaries found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, but the first and the last are observable on the ground. The aggressive, unprovoked destruction of Mount Gerizim instantiates the first of these interventions. The last, the invention of a new ritual linked to Hasmonean party affiliation, can be reconstructed from the remains at five sites, Jericho, Qumran, Gezer, Um el Umdan, which is ancient Modi'in, and Gamla up north in central Galanitis. First, Jericho and the Hasmonean Palace, which we saw last week, a compound with a formal meeting or dining room, colonnaded entryway, frescoed walls, two pools, all components of luxury living in the mode of Hellenistic royals and elites, and inside, a private mikvah, the first one yet attested in Israel. A mikvah is a constructed installation, a pool deep enough to allow complete immersion so as to become ritually clean. In the Hebrew Bible, there are temple-based rituals that require purification by washing or sprinkling, but none require a specific installation. The word mikvah exists, but it doesn't mean an individual pool. It refers to a body of water, water gathered from a spring, water in a large public reservoir. The notion of a purpose-built installation does not exist in the Hebrew Bible. 
nor have any such installations been found in First Temple period sites. It is, in other words, an invention. The location of the first appearance of this invention, a residence situated at a considerable distance from the temple, is odd. What ritual should it accompany? This is domestic space, not a worship site. If now there is a ritual based in the home that requires purification, that too must be something of an invention. Or, to put it less polemically, it must derive from new readings of older texts. The newness of this installation, the absence of any biblical references, and its appearance at a location indisputably belonging to the Hasmonean family combine to suggest that the mikvah and the rituals associated with it were Hasmonean innovations. The next datable examples appear in the time of Alexander Janaeus' sons, and all they can also be linked to the Hasmoneans. At Jericho, the next mikvah oat, are in two private bath suites, each also fitted out with small plastered bathtubs, that's what you've been looking at here, located in side-by-side -side villas east of the earlier palace compound and south of a new pool and garden pavilion. The villas are identical in size and plan. They must have belonged to Janaeus' sons, Hyrcanus II and Aristobulus II, which would mean that they date sometime in the 70s BCE. At Qumran, we see something different, neither village nor farmstead, but a walled compound with several outsized and group facilities, including a large communal dining hall, two sizable cisterns, and at least seven mikvaot. The best indication of their date in the early to mid first century BCE is that several of these mikvaot cracked in an earthquake that we know occurred in the year 31 BCE. That demonstrates that they were built and had been in use prior to that time. The mikvaot at Umelum Dan, Modi'in, and Gezer are similar in size and plan to those at Jericho. The Modi'in mikvah is next to a small public building that has been tentatively identified as a synagogue. We'll return to this site and that identification in next week's lecture. For our present purposes, I'll simply note that this is not a private home. The Gezer installations do seem to be in homes. They have been identified by Ronnie Rye, who recognized them from studying the site's late 19th century excavation plans. The places themselves had been removed in subsequent excavation. No dating material exists. Rye has suggested that these mikvaot may be linked with a reference in 1st Maccabees to Simon's conquest of Gezer and his settling there of, quote, men who obeyed the law. In the book's chronology, that occurs in 143 or 142 BCE, which, if true, would make them by far the earliest known mikvaot. I don't happen to think that they are that early, but in, per, for purposes of this discussion, it doesn't really matter because their appearance at Gezer still indicates an association with the Hasmoneans, which I probably do not need to remind you is also the case at Modi'in. From this generational moment, the other known mikvaot appear in one northern town, that of Gamla. Here we have an interesting situation. Gamla was settled already in the early second century BCE. Coins and datable household pottery show us that the people who lived here had regular contact with the Mediterranean coast. They used coins issued by the mints of Tyre and Akko, and those cities were also the transshipment points or sources for the many imported serving dishes, figural mold-made lamps that had been found at the site. In other words, the homes and possessions of Gamla's second and early first century BCE residents were consistent with the standard cosmopolitan Mediterranean repertoire of the day. We might presume on that account that the town's inhabitants were Phoenicians or Gadarenes, but what happens next suggests otherwise. I said a little bit ago that according to Josephus, Janaeus spent almost all his military reign on all his reign on military campaign. His final assaults took place in the year 80 BCE when he captured, looted, and destroyed the cities of Amathus, Ragaba, Pella, and Dion, all east of the Jordan River. In this same campaign, Janaeus came to Gamla, but he did not attack it. 
Instead, he took it over and replaced its governor, a man named Demetrius, on account, Josephus tells us, quote, of numerous accusations. <laughs> Gamla is the only place that Janaeus leaves be, a decision that is borne out by the archaeological evidence says there is no trace of a destruction here at this time. Janaeus, in other words, seems to have regarded those living at Gamla as compatriots, although apparently ones in need of a heavier governing hand. In the chronology of Janaeus's campaigns, his actions here occurred in around 80 BCE, and that makes the datable evidence from the excavations very interesting. Because three new developments show up in the second quarter of the first century, between around 75 and 50. In other words, right after the campaigns of Janaeus. First, a new neighborhood is constructed. Excavators have cleared two large blocks in many houses and shown that there is no prior occupation here. These homes were built fresh at this time. Second, in this new neighborhood, two mikvaot are built. One is in a private house, as at Gezer. The other is in a large room that also contains a bathtub, just like those in the Hasmonean palaces at Jericho. This seems to have been a neighborhood facility. Entry is through a secluded alley right off the street. The third change that comes to Gamla are new forms of the most basic household vessels, namely cooking pots and storage jars. The forms are new at Gamla, but they are not inventions. They are identical to types that have been known for at least two centuries in Judea. But we know from petrographic clay analysis that the Gamla vessels are not Judean. They were all made in the environs of central Galanitis, probably close to Gamla itself. You can see what I mean by looking at this, at the images right here. The cooking pots all share a high, slightly canted neck. The storage jars all share a heavy bag-shaped body with a thickened, rounded, or squared rim. The most logical explanation for the sudden appearance of Judean-style household vessels in local fabrics is that Judeans themselves have moved up here. Some of those people were probably potters who would have started making necessary household vessels in their own traditional styles. The same phenomenon, locally made household goods in Judean forms, now also occurs at a number of small new settlements in the Lower Galilee. Unlike Gamla, these are brand new settlements instead of already established towns. Once settled, all continued to be inhabited and to expand in size. In the first century CE, some, such as Magdala, Kirbet Kana, and Capernaum, come to be associated with the early Jesus movement. Their later history as Jewish towns is additional circumstantial support for identifying their first settlers as Judeans. In some of these new settlements, people's household goods are limited to very basic plain items, just like the simplified Judean homes that we saw last time. Recall that in Judea, that shift took place around the middle of the second century BCE, one to two generations earlier. But at Gamla and some other places, for example, Capernaum, a town at the northern tip of the Sea of Galilee, residents continued to use imported dishes, figural decorated lamps acquired from coastal suppliers. While such visibly foreign goods have by now disappeared from sites in Judea, the picture that we see in the Galilean settlements is less starkly divided. To sum up generational moment one, the Hasmoneans work to redefine a number of components of Judaism and to entwine them with their own personas. In the last decade of the second century BCE, John Hyrcanus pursues a militant expansionism to remove any rivals to the temple in Jerusalem, as well as eradicate those who lived oriented to the Mediterranean world. Janaeus continued both strategies. Under Hyrcanus, the new ritual of purifying immersion was introduced, along with an installation to accommodate it. That ritual and its installation could now be a marker of religious orthodoxy and political allegiance.
after 80 BCE, Judeans begin colonizing the Lower Galilee, perhaps at least partially under the eye of the newly installed Hasmonean governor at Gamla. But while those living in Jerusalem, Modi'in, and Gezer may follow a more orthodox Hasmonean lifestyle, that does not seem to be the case for those living in the new northern settlements. Mikvaot appear only at Gamla, and even there, people continue to use imported dishes and figured lamps. Finally, it is probably under Janaeus that someone writes the Hasmonean dynastic epic of 1 Maccabees, glorifying the family's heroic resistance to the Seleucids and recounting how they created an independent state. As one generational moment gives way to the next, it is this last contribution that will prove the most influential. It's okay. <laughs> yes, right, good timing. <laughs> Moment two, Antigonus versus Herod. We move ahead one generation to the year 39 BCE. The text of 1 Maccabees has the stature of received history, and that's exactly what it is, in the sense that the dynasty, whose rise it recounts, was dismantled over 20 years ago. In 63 BCE, the Romans, alarmed at the vicious feud between Aristobulus II and Hyrcanus II, and the re-emergence of instability here, sent the Roman general Pompey to Damascus in Syria with orders to settle the state or take it over. Pompey met with the brothers and their supporters, affirmed the position of Hyrcanus the elder. Aristobulus responded by taking over the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This led to Pompey's siege, partial destruction of the city walls, the taking of Aristobulus and his sons as hostages back to Rome. Pompey dismantled the Hasmonean hierocratic government. He put the region's civil affairs under the jurisdiction of a Roman governor and relegated Hyrcanus to the position of high priest. The Hasmonean kingdom was no more. But political calm did not return. Five years after Pompey's settlement, the younger son of Aristobulus, Mattathias Antigonus, escaped from Rome, returned to Judea, and began fighting his uncle for control, a battle that he pressed for 18 years. Last year, he finally succeeded, the result of a great power struggle between a resurgent Parthia and a crisis-laden Rome. The Parthian king Pacorus, with the help of a renegade Roman, took over the entirety of the East, from Asia Minor to the Levant, including Judea, and put Antigonus on the throne in Jerusalem. But the Roman Senate regards Judea as their territory, and they too have named a king. He is Herod, Scion of an elite Idumean family. His father Antipater was the chief advisor to Hyrcanus II, and Herod himself served seven years as governor of Galilee. Just last year, he married Mariamne, a granddaughter of Hyrcanus, a Hasmonean princess. So, <laughs> we have one kingdom and two kings, <laughs> both backed by outside powers, both sons of wealth, both connected to the Hasmonean dynasty. But this is not a story of politics, per se. We are after the social underpinnings and repercussions of these events, a sense of how the political fight was instantiated on the ground. Are there contemporary material remains that can help us see how Antigonus and Herod were representing themselves and how persuaded people were by either side? There are four groups of remains that can help us locate where at least some people stand right now. These are the coins struck by Antigonus and contemporary finds from Jerusalem, Samaria, and Gamla. First, the coins. Antigonus strikes in Jerusalem, where, in fact, one of his minting plans has been found. Up until this moment, Hyrcanus has continued to issue small change, retaining the legends and inscriptions of his father, Janaeus. For the most part, Antigonus does the same, although 
he replaces the name of Janaeus with his own name and title, King Antigonus. But he also introduces one completely new type. It displays two cult objects from the temple, ones that by law were visible only to priests. On one side, the showbread table, depicted with two stacks of loaves, and on the other, the menorah. This is the first time these objects have ever been illustrated, and their display communicates an unambiguous message. Antigonus has the right to rule as both king and high priest. His legitimacy is tied to the temple in Jerusalem. He will restore the Hasmonean hierarchy, the independent kingdom lost to the Romans. A map showing the distribution of the coins of Antigonus reveals that his support was very limited, really, to Judea and mostly to the region between Jerusalem and Jericho. Meanwhile, a look at household goods from Jerusalem, Samaria, and Gamla also affirm the suggestion of a divided political moment. In Jerusalem, there are no imports, only plainly finished jars and pitchers, saucers and bowls, narrow mouth cooking pots. But there is something new, a new type of locally made lamp. The form is similar to and probably a version of imported lamps. Both have a domed body and a rim decorated simply by radial grooves. Clay analysis shows that these lamps were made in the vicinity of Jerusalem itself and they are found only in Judea. Considering their place of manufacture and their limited distribution, I am very tempted to connect their introduction with a new emphasis in Judea on Shabbat lamp lighting, a household ritual that could now take place using a lamp specifically identifiable as Judean. Meanwhile, at Samaria, people have a plentiful assortment of shiny imported red slip plates and cups and figural mold made lamps from various Levantine and Mediterranean workshops. Considering the proximity of these two cities and the fact that they are both inland this is unlikely to be the result of a compromised supply chain. It must instead reflect differences in demand, with Jerusalemites wanting to maintain homes of unadorned simplicity, while Sumerians were instead open to the contemporary Mediterranean material culture. And up at Gamla, what's happening up there? There are a few changes. People now use new shapes of cooking vessels. Some of these come from a new workshop recently established in the Lower Galilee, a place called Kfar Hanania. Some are made near Gamla itself. People buy two shapes, a round cooking pot with a narrow mouth, good for soups, and a wide-bodied, wide mouth vessel. I'll call them casseroles, which are good for recipes that use large chunks of meat or fish or vegetables. Both of these forms are versions of vessel types that have long been popular in the Phoenician coastal cities of Aquitolemaeus and Tyre, and also in inland towns. The coastal inspiration is worthy of note, as is the continued appearance of imported dishes and figural mold-made lamps. Another change is that sometime in the second half of the first century BCE, both mikvaot go out of use. In the case of the private mikvah, it cracked, and though it could have been repaired, it was just built over. In the case of the public mikvah, a new wall was built across the room, the floor was raised, and the pool was turned into a kind of storage bin for large jars. By the middle of the first century BCE, or shortly thereafter, there are no functioning mikvah at Gamla. One may wonder how the current generation, the children of the original Judean settlers regarded the confrontation down south between Antigonus and Herod. In this regard, it is worth noting the, coin, the site's coin profile. 
a total of 5,892 coins were found at Gamla, of which 3,964, that's 63%, were Hasmonean issues. And of these, there was not a single coin of Antigonus. Generation three, Herod. In five BCE, Herod had been king for so long that an entire generation had come of age. Since his conclusive defeat of Antigonus and the latter's humiliating public execution in Antioch, he ruled unchallenged, despite, according to Josephus, of being thoroughly despised by his subjects. There is little reason to doubt that there would have been many with excellent reasons to feel that way. In his 34 years in power, Herod compiled a breathtaking record of ruthlessness, violence, and cruelty. But material remains from the final decades of the first century BCE suggest that there was another angle to relations between Herod and some of his subjects, a comparison between the remains and decor of the king's palatial residences with contemporary homes of Jerusalem's most elite families suggests that in matters of taste and lifestyle, Herod was something of a cultural model for wealthy Jerusalemites. For us, observing at a telescopic remove, it is a relationship that is unexpected. Certainly there is little hint of it in our written sources. But to the point of our aim here, which is to track behavior and its underlying social location and implications, it was a relationship that was ultimately disastrous. The adoption of Mediterranean, cosmopolitan, and Herodian-style luxury by Jewish elites compromised their personas, a compromise that eventually played a role in their, and not only their, undoing. Before we look at the evidence for the relationship between Herod and his Jewish elite contemporaries, a little reminder of the evidence for Judean royal and Jewish elite lifestyles of the immediately preceding generation. Of course, they were one and the same. In, they were together in the Hasmonean palatial compound at Jericho because the Hasmoneans were both Judean royalty and Jewish elites. Edward de Broa and Eyal Regev have lately weighed in on what they see as the precise character of the Hasmonean royal lifestyle. They argue about how Jewish it was versus how Hellenistic, how distinct or not distinct it was from that of contemporary Judeans. The parsing, I think, is something of a blinkered project. I would say that the Hasmoneans were very conscious of crafting a hybridized amalgam. On the one hand, they had mikvaot, and they used only locally made household goods, the same simple array that we see in Jerusalem and elsewhere in Judea at this time. On the other hand, the palaces had cosmopolitan accoutrement, interior decor, Greek style colonnades, special purpose meeting and dining rooms, pools, garden pavilions. We do not find such embellishment in Jerusalem or Judea in the early first century BCE. Herod became the uncontested king of Judea in 37. In the first years of his rule, his only construction was a new compound at Jericho. In those years, Cleopatra owned the oasis. Yes, it's true. Mark Antony gave it to her as a wedding gift. <laughs> and it appears that Herod did not want to antagonize the Ptolemaic queen. Six years later came the Battle of Actium, where Octavian destroyed Antony and Cleopatra's combined forces. Herod traveled to Rhodes to meet the victorious Octavian and promise his loyalty. And in return, Octavian gave him control of almost the entirety of the southernmost Levant. During the next decade, Herod threw himself into a series of enormous construction projects. The most ambitious was the construction of an entirely new city with its own man-made harbor. This is Caesarea Maritima, whose name honors the family of Herod's Roman patron. Herod also built 
two huge temples, both dedicated jointly to the goddess Roma and Augustus, the new name for Octavian, whom the Senate has now made imperator of the consolidated Roman world. One of those temples overlooked the harbor of Caesarea. The second was on the summit of Samaria, now renamed Sebaste, also in honor of Augustus. Sebastos is Greek for Augustus. Good fact. <laughs> in this same decade of the 20s, Herod also built five palatial compounds, one adjoining the Temple of Roma and Augustus on the summit of Samaria, a second at Caesarea Maritima on a promontory with a good view of the new harbor, a third in Jerusalem on the edge of the western hill, a fourth on the summit of Masada, a high naturally defensible mesa in the Judean desert overlooking the Dead Sea, and a fifth back at Jericho where he added a lavish new wing to the east of the Hasmonean twin villas. In the next decade, he built additions to the palaces at Masada and Jericho and a sixth palace at Herodium, a place that he built completely from scratch. It's a totally artificial mountain and modestly named for himself. In these palaces, we can see how Herod constructed his own quite fabulous version of the Judean royal lifestyle. As I've just pointed out, some of these features were already part of life in the Hasmonean palaces, although the Herodian versions are far more lavish and up to the minute. And here I need to pause and apologize because this is the part of the presentation that could very easily devolve into a kind of dazzling picture show. And while that would be its own sort of fun, it would just belabor the essential point, which is that most of the specific Mediterranean objects and styles cultivated by Herod were quickly adopted by Jewish elites. So I will only give a few examples. In the new luxury wing that Herod built for his second palace at Jericho, there was a large dining room with brilliantly colored frescoed panels evoking imported marble. The inclusion of a dining room suitable for formal meals is not new. Last week we saw second and early first century BCE examples from Marissa in Idumea, Tel Anafa in the Hula Valley, and also uh, in, at Jericho where there were two triclinia, Roman style dining rooms, in the side by side villas that belong to Hyrcanus and Aristobulus. Such rooms are material evidence for a specific activity, which today we might call status entertaining. Herod included such rooms in all of his palaces. At the first of his compounds at Masada, the so-called Western Palace, guests passed over a spectacular mosaic floor on the way to the dining room. In the third palace at Jericho, the dining room walls again carried vividly colored frescoes, and the floor was inlaid with pieces of cut marble, a Roman technique called opus sectile. And you can see that this was an enormous room, more of a banquet hall than a dining room. A reconstruction drawing may give you some sense of its spectacular effect. Guests dined off of imported red slip dishes whose size and finish would have made a pretty sharp contrast to the small, plain, locally made saucers and bowls. Accompanying the dishes were glass drinking cups that would have been filled with wine imported from the Aegean, the Adriatic, the Western Mediterranean, even as far west as Spain. The jars, some of them specially marked for Herod, you see here uh, the revered and late Ehud Netzer holding one of them. These uh, imported jars have been found at Masada, at Jericho, at Herodium, and at Caesarea. In all of the palaces, there were personal bathing suites with bathtubs and plunge pools. As everything else, this is not new. You may recall there was a private bathing suite at Tel Anafa, the tubs next to the mikvaot in the twin villas at Jericho, the new neighborhood facility at Gamla. Herod's suites, of course, were more elaborate. Here you are looking at um, what's called a laconicum, a sweat room. <laughs> um, you know, it's pretty hot in Jericho. It's a little hard to know why you, <laughs> you would need a sweat room. But, um, and in some of the places, including, including here in the Third Palace at Jericho, there were mikvaot, probably to accommodate Jewish guests because there were many guests. 
This is very clear from the size of the public rooms, the numerous bedroom suites, the banquet halls. Most of these guests would have belonged to the local aristocracy, priests and members of Judean landed families, power brokers whom Herod needed to cultivate, placate, and impress via displays of his authority, his connections, and his cultural knowledge. And his strategies worked, as we can see from the remains of houses that belonged to some of those elites. Those houses were built on the western hill of Jerusalem, the so-called upper city, in the last decades of the first century BCE, soon after Herod had consolidated his control and built the first of his palatial compounds. Professor Nachman Avigad, who directed excavations here in the 1970s, described these new constructions in the following way, I quote, the upper city was densely built up. The houses are close to each other, but the spaciousness of the individual dwellings lent them the character of luxurious villas. The houses were decorated with wall frescoes with stucco modeled in relief. They were paved with colorful mosaics. They were equipped with elaborate bathing installations. They contained stone furniture, luxury goods, ornaments, and the like, indicating a high standard of living. Let's see some details. First of all, there was lavish interior decor. Vestibules had multicolored, patterned mosaic floors. There were large interior courtyards, some with columns surrounding the open space. There were furnishings crafted in Greco-Roman styles. In the lower right, you see a decorative furniture attachment that depicts an Amazon, the female warrior of Greek epic. On the walls of courtyards, bedrooms, and dining rooms were wall frescoes with an array of designs, Greek-style architectural moldings, flowers and fruit, such as the pomegranates that you see here in the lower left, panels of swirling colors to imitate variegated Aegean marble. There were special dining rooms with everything necessary for elaborate dinner parties, including wine imported from the Aegean, Italy and North Africa. For dispensing wine, there were decanters in copper alloy and cast in blown glass, copper alloy ladles with decorated handles. I think of them as bling. They, <laughs> yes, because analysis of the alloy shows that they were especially shiny, that the ratio of copper to tin was modified to make them even shinier. <laughs> People drank from glass cups and goblets at the table. Food was served on glossy red slip plates and bowls from Cyprus, Antioch, and Italy, whose bright color sent a vivid message of Mediterranean refinement. And there were personal luxuries, small bottles for scented oil, gold-hued brass finger rings, expensive gems of carnelian, agate, and rock crystal, carved with figures such as Hermes and Fortuna, and here, a scorpion. Every household also had individual bathing suites with a bathtub and a mikvah. What this tells us is that Jerusalem's aristocrats also now follow what has come to be an orthodox understanding of household ritual. Their possessions and household decor do not mean that they have become less Jewish they have simply added in Mediterranean fashions, styles, and goods. Professor Avigad characterized them as people who could have imagined themselves sitting amidst their luxury in a villa at Pompeii or Herculaneum were it not for the fine view of Mount Moriah through the window rather than Mount Vesuvius. Indeed, an upper crust Italian arriving to Jerusalem could have said the same thing here as the first century CE Roman satirist Juvenal said about Roman elite life. Luxuria incubuit. Luxury has settled down. I'm going to close with one last look into a Jewish house at the end of the first century BCE, back up at Gamla. It won't take long. Nothing has changed. The third generation of Judean settlers here live as their parents had. They set their tables with imported dishes and mold-made lamps. They use both cooking pots and casseroles. 
The bathtub in the neighborhood suite still functions, but there are no mikvaot. Neither of the old ones have been repaired. Herod dies in 4 BCE. His three sons inherit his kingdom. And material remains show us that dramatic change comes almost overnight. We can connect those remains to the actions of Herod's sons and the realizations they engendered. Josephus provides a harbinger. In the year 6 CE, he tells us that a certain Judas, a Gaulanite from a city named Gamla, threw himself into the cause of rebellion and appealed to the nation to make a bid for independence. A decision to revolt is still two generations away, but the countdown has begun. We'll see what that looks like on the ground next week. Um, I, think, I think first we're going to get response. Hold your question. Yes? Is that right? That's correct. Okay. <laughs> so as was said uh, last week, this is obviously a very uh, tough act to follow, to describe and respond to something uh, which can... Uh, at minimum be described as an exciting tour through history. And I have to say that it's really rare to be at a public lecture where somebody puts up pictures of domestic ceramics and there are audible cheers in the audience. <laughs> so I think everybody, Andrew is obviously to be commended, um, as are you, because that's something that's really exciting to sort of encounter in the day to day. So thank you so much to Andrea and to Bard Graduate Center for the opportunity to respond to her exciting lecture, which again is really a tour um, through the late Hellenistic and early Roman periods in Judea, in the Galilee, and Golanitis, um, to lay the groundwork uh, for what she will continue to discuss, uh, exploring deepening divides within society of those regions, which ultimately become intractable by periods leading up to the Jewish revolt. And I think the suspense here is really palpable. Um, in fact, she demonstrates how the peculiar economic, social, and cultural conditions of these periods render inevitable the social and political conflagrations that follow, which are really exacerbated by regional but also cross-regional tumult. She focuses in particular on three generational moments from the end of Alexander Janaeus' rule to the end of Herod's reign. And to be sure, this covers a, a, an extended period of political transformation in these regions, which is of great import um, not only within Judea, the Galilee, Galanitas, but also in Syria and adjacent regions. Um, so we know that this period of time is going to be a very bumpy one, but we're also reminded as we sort of look at these slides of something I always tell my students who might think that um, the tumult in the Levant today is something of a novelty. We're reminded that this is just, you know, another point along a sad continuum. Exactly. So it's a reminder of this, just at a slightly more remove, and hopefully we have you know, fewer killings of children and things like this today. So, um, but Andrew doesn't just take author's words for what she describes, the sort of historiography she weaves through objects. Um, and she doesn't uh, necessarily use it as a framework or look for objects to sort of confirm their words. It's really tempting to do historiography in this way, especially from objects, and most people actually do. Because uh, the narrator of First Maccabees, and also when we look at Josephus, they're very good at telling stories. Um, and they're a very good distraction from modern life as well. But however detailed their, their accounts might seem, which at times it almost seems journalistic, um, their histories are only partial. Um, and so relying on them can be a little bit misleading, even though it's very attractive. First, their writings are really political in focus polemical in nature, 
and dramatic by design and style. And while the persons and events they recount surely impacted the day-to-day -day lives of most people living in the regions that we saw, um, in many, if not most cases, their accounts cannot summarize the totality of anyone's existence sort of living in the day-to-day. So in Judea, whether during the reigns of, of, of one uh, Hasmonean ruler or another, people still had to put one foot in front of the other. They had to tend to their animals and they had to tend to their children. Hopefully they don't keep them in pens together, but maybe they did. Um, all of them needed to be fed, regardless of what conniving son of whatever Hasmonean ruler was, was in place. Um, and people needed to prepare that food. They ate it together in their homes as families, um, as Andrea has noted elsewhere, and they even washed themselves on occasion, maybe at some points less rare of occasion than others in specific ways. But however common were such daily activities in day-to-day -day lives, I mean, these are things that people do today, right, uh, in their own iterations. We know little about these things from the literary sources on which most people depend for history of the period. They're not, it's not really that entertaining to talk about sitting around a dinner table uh, in an average family. Um, so historians as well as archaeologists have taken the leads of these ancient authors to really emphasize histories of the period that, that talk about, it's not even the 1% of society, but maybe the 0.00001% of society. Um, but that leaves everyone else pretty much understudied. So it also misses something quite important. The more substantive ways that disparate cultural policies of the Hasmoneans, or Herod for that matter, truly impacted the daily existences of people on the ground, uh, whether the masses or the wealthy elites. I'm biased because to me this history is sort of the most interesting type of history, even if it's not the most swashbuckling, um, and I'll talk more about that tomorrow. But um, Andrew's lecture today, which forms a part of her household Judaism project writ large, demonstrates why this approach is really a game changer in so many ways. And I'll just mention a few points um, as to why that is, and most of these things are, are observable here. Um, first, Andrea always pays attention to the big picture, which is something that you emphasized earlier, which seems sort of obvious, but it's not necessarily obvious because people don't necessarily do it. Um, it reminds us that Judea is a really tiny place. It's a very little piece of real estate, however contested it has been for millennia. And so keeping that big picture in mind in terms of regional politics and dynamics is really important and essential to understanding um, how Hasmoneans and why the Hasmoneans sort of recast um, the regional cultural matrix as they do, the types of religious reforms they introduce and these sorts of things, and how they interface with Judeans' lives, particularly within um, a very complicated world um, in which the region has been sort of Hellenized in a very erratic way and then Romanized in a sort of erratic way. The second feature, which I think is remarkable and important, which again seems really obvious when you see a lecture like this, is the generational approach. So as Andrew puts it, to grant each generation the reality of their times. And I think this is true, what she says, that we tend to really flatten out history. There are things that happen uh, during the reign of one particular king or another, um, or even things that happen at the beginning of Herod's reign as opposed to the end. And that really deprives us of greater insights into the our, our approach to the artifacts that we see on the ground. I mean, when we look at the way that people use objects that might actually look very similar, if we're talking about a generation that came of age during the Vietnam War, or I think that it's called, this is how old I am, the, it's called iGen, right? The generation that sort of grew up with smartphones from the age of two or something like this. Yeah, that's what, that's what they tell me. So even if a bathtub is still a bathtub in both of these periods of time, the way people use objects, I'm not saying bathtub specifically, because that's a tough one, okay? People bathe in it. But at the same time, it's very important to pay attention to these subtleties of the historical record, because we just miss too much when we have so little to use as data to begin with. Um, Andrew does a third thing that is significant in offering more nuanced interpretations of the lives of Judeans and people in other 
regions in the Galilee and Galanitis of multiple generations. And she does this by liberating the archaeological evidence from the hegemony of literary texts in a certain way and of traditional historiography. By paying closer attention to diverse but related genres of evidence, whether bronze coins or cooking wares or tablewares, she notices in a more sensitive way important patterns of regional continuities and change, at least in domestic life. And this is what her supports are her arguments about things like regional migration in Gamla um, through evidence from the actual uh, fabric of ceramics and their typologies. Um, shifting the gaze to agonistic displays and markets for luxury among Jerusalem's elites sort of does the same thing. It demonstrates additional and otherwise elusive ancient realities that sort of start to bubble under the surface in ways that we can't necessarily see in such stark relief from, um, from certain literary sources. So to Andrew, it's not just the changes in dynastic succession that predict emerging and sort of exacerbated uh, fissures in Judean life and life elsewhere. In many respects, she demonstrates in more substantive ways why it is actually other types of changes, not just sort of changes of political framework. Um, but these types of changes are indexed only through the archaeological record and at times only traceable through shifts in shapes and importation patterns of seemingly mundane objects, like the ones that evoked cheers here earlier, so which is very happy, right? Such as cookwares or dinnerwares or locations of mikvaot that can offer more powerful types of information about how people are living in the day to day. These findings and typologies matter in the bigger picture because they com index the complex, complex cultural worlds of their creators, purchasers, users. They tell us stories, otherwise untold, about the lives of the people who cooked with these things and ate with them and bathed in them, rich and poor alike. Scholars of cultural studies, let alone those who adopt phenomenological approaches to interpreting the archaeological record, would need little convincing that differences in diet, trade patterns, and aesthetics, no less, which these objects and architectural features bespeak, attest to not wholly recoverable, but critical attitudes and choices, as she puts it, of the ancient actors who created and used them. So there are a few tantalizing questions that remain, many tantalizing questions that remain for me, and some of them will be um, I'm surely addressed next week. I find the example from Mount Gerizim so interesting that you touched upon earlier. And because I'm sort of biased to the treatment of words and things like this, I do sort of wonder, too, whether, um, whether the example of the destruction of, of that specific space and cultic space was sort of the destruction of a rival cult center only, or whether there was something about the words, these inscriptions, the ways that people had used writing to worship Yahweh in a different place were also sort of specifically targeted for destruction as, as you describe it. But ultimately, where does this leave us, aside from the fact that you just want to ask Andrew questions? Uh, primarily, we've gained invaluable insights into this critical period of history by more carefully examining the stratigraphy and differences between regional archaeological sites, examining them and the excavation records for them, specifically like with Gezer, uh, with a finer tooth comb to look at generational differences that bespeak broader and otherwise imperceptible acceptable changes with sensitivity to regional and class differences, which again is, is quite rare. So I look forward, as do you, to hearing more next week and in her finished work. Thank you so much. Thanks to both of our speakers, and we now have a few moments uh, for questions from the floor. Yes. general Mediterranean dominant culture was from Greece and Rome. But were these <coughs> these uh, Judeans or Israelites, or I'm not quite sure what the proper name is, were they continuing to practice what defines them as Jewish? You know, the uh, rituals of circumcision and, mm -hmm. and the Sabbath and the rules of, of kashrut and things like that? So that's a, so I don't know if everybody, I don't know if everybody heard the question. The question is, um, during this contested time, were all these people continuing to practice many of the aspects of Judaism that we, we today associate with uh, the, the religion, kashrut, circumcision, what was your other one? Um, Sabbath. 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 Sabbath, Passover, okay. Um, so, it, it, 
a number of um, a number of things are very are are provable. People came to Jerusalem for the big pilgrimage festivals. Not really quite yet. Actually, I'm going to get to that next week. So starting in the later part of the first century BC, we have evidence of um, water installations, large pools, all kinds of water facilities for pilgrims. They weren't there before. They show up. That's one of the ways that we know that people start to come. Now, does that mean that people didn't come before? No. It just means that it wasn't a habit, and it becomes more widespread. And most things are like that. So again, next week we'll see evidence for a whole slew of behaviors. We'll see material evidence on the ground for a whole slew of behaviors that we today take for granted in association, but we didn't see the evidence before. Does that mean people didn't do it? Did they not light candles for Shabbat or light or um, lamps for Shabbat? Some probably did. But it's the difference that we see, the evidence that we see for difference that tells us that there was a kind of shift um, in intensity and distribution. Would the people who lived in Jerusalem in the third century BC, 200 years earlier, have called themselves Eudaioi, Judeans, in a way that we would also understand as Jewish? They would have. But their Judaism was not your Judaism. It was a different kind of Judaism. Uh, Should I call on people? Or do Thank you. Um, my question is about the Paleo uh, Hebrew on the uh, Mount Gerizim inscription. Exactly. Um, we we know from from uh, the uh, uh, from Deuteronomy and from Joshua how Moses had commanded the people to you know to, to actually uh, write things on great slabs and Joshua. Uh, carried it out. Is there any, could this be, was, was, was this, is there any thought that this is from a much earlier period? You mentioned that it was just from 200 years before then. Would that perhaps be? All the inscriptions on Mount Gerizim are written in the first half of the second century BC. We can date them paleographically. When <laughs> Yahweh is written in Paleo Hebrew, it's the only word written in Paleo Hebrew. Like in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like, like in, the in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I'm so struck by um, your, your demonstration of the fact that household goods is connected to political affiliation. It's so wonderful. <laughs> example. And I, I wonder if you see Herod's embracing of the Roman materials that you showed us and worldview and wine and all the rest and uh, um, very um, cunning political choice to demonstrate his obsequiousness and affiliation to the Romans or whether it's just this incredibly seductive beautiful style that he and all of his subjects embrace that is how much of a tool is culture in that's a, that's a great question, and I think that a way for us to achieve some sense of how to answer what was Herod up to is to think about who his audience would have been. So we know that over the course of the entirety of his more than 30-year reign, one Roman came one time. That was Marcus Agrippa. So, and yet... Five palaces, lots of guest rooms, <laughs> you know, lots of guests, local. The people he must have been playing to were, were not the Romans. But there's, another, but there's another really important point there. Herod, 
This is really fascinating. Okay, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to keep this short. I know that there are other people with questions. Herod is the scion of a land, a family of landed Idumeans. Their home is in northern Idumea. Guess what's really close? A really close town. I'll tell you. Modi'in. Who are the Hasmoneans? They are a landed family in Western Judea. These people are rival aristocratic families. The Hasmoneans get culture. Herod becomes king. He needs to prove that he belongs. We have an recorded for us by Josephus, no, it, yeah, by Josephus, an accusation that Antigonus makes to the Roman general who is supporting Herod when the two of them are duking it out around Jerusalem in the year 40. He calls Herod a half-Jew, a hemiudios. No, it's a makeup term. He, he, it's like, it's a, it, he makes it up. It's a term that was never before or after used. It's, it's a, Herod, in other words, is scorned by the Hasmoneans. He has something to prove about his cultural knowledge and position. So I don't think it's obsequious, and I don't think it's for the Romans. And I think that one of his chief audiences was himself. Religiosity. Can you tell whether the aristocrats, the the, the priests, and the Hasmoneans and Herod served m meat and milk on different dishes? <laughs> you can't. <laughs> we can't. Yeah, that's a fast Can you tell whether the commoners did. Oh, so what I can tell you is this: if they get rid of the, the bread. So what I can tell you. So the question again is about this thing that we'd love to know, did they keep kosher? <laughs> and we cannot tell, but what we can tell is they didn't have two sets of dishes. Okay. Do you know what I mean? No, I mean, I you can take, right? I, you can take my word for it, I've looked at tens of thousands of fragments from, from sites. And there's, in, in any given household, there's one set. I, you don't know. Okay. I can tell you there's one set. Did they have other cultic gods other than Yahweh? We don't have any evidence for it. Can you tell, well, I don't know if you can, but can you tell from the tax rolls in um, Rome what the population was and or the distribution of peoples in these various cities? The question is, can we tell from tax rolls in Rome who, who is living where in Judea? And the answer is, we wish. <laughs> but we don't have the tax rolls, so we, we can't. <laughs> I'll take us back to Gerizim. And in answer to the first question, your answer basically uh, outlined the evidence for the systematization of practices that came to be Jewish practice. And so looking at the material from uh, the smashed up inscriptions from Gerizim uh, from another angle, I'd like to ask two different questions, one of which is really outside of your purview, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, so Ava. See, uh, um, you, you described um, Alexander Janaeus smashing up this cult site and others uh, with an iconoclastic fervor of, of uh, breaking to smithereens in, in dedicatory inscriptions. Um, and uh, of course, we've seen this kind of thing before in the 8th and 7th century, when uh, presumably Hezekiah uh, bashes up the temple at Arad in the earliest uh, archaeologically attested episode of what appears to be cultic centralization. And then we see it again under Josiah. 
as described in the biblical account and so forth. But the biblical account, of course, which allows us to interpret that early, earlier evidence, hadn't been written yet. So uh, when we see it in the second century BCE, how much are we seeing a repetition of the past, and how much are we seeing the creation of that past, which will be memorialized or has been added textually? Second question, before you write that one, in the inscriptions you showed, they smashed them up, but they left the name of Yahweh mm -hmm. unbroken. Mm -hmm. On purpose. That's got to be on purpose. That's got to be on purpose. And actually, I was thinking, so Karen made this excellent point about, um, she wonders, or she raised an excellent question. She wonders about the particularization of the damage and how it was done. So there have been, in the last 10 years, a few um, articles and a couple of books about the community up there in the inscription. The, the excavations had only been recent, have only recently been done, so it couldn't happen before. But nobody has looked at it from that point of view. Karen brings a particular uh, marriage of materiality and text to the way she looks at things. And I was thinking, she should go and do, she should study that, because she, I don't think anybody has studied it from that particular vantage point. But certainly the ones that we can see, they look quite purposeful that way. As to whether, in a sense, um, the actions of Hezekiah and Josiah from, uh, which were probably not written down until fifth or fourth or much well, later. Question, even if they, the account was composed at one time, it was also re-edited and... Uh, it was, but the point is, is that by the second century BC, it would have been no. It, it would have been history and it's well known that the text of 1st Maccabees, so scholars who study the text of 1st Maccabees qua text as, as a con literary construction, the language, the way that the narrative is formed, have noted much, much, much uh, literary <laughs> similarity with the book of Joshua. And the author of 1st Maccabees knows his Bible. He knows the territory of the land that is to be conquered, whether or not it was actually conquered by the Maccabees, by the Hasmoneans. He writes about it as if it was. He re-narrates episodes that we can recognize in the book of Joshua. So books, or more to the point, stories that give you a template, what I called in my talk a script have a lot of power to help people come to terms with what they want to do. I think we have time for one more question there in the oh. back. What, what financial resources did Herod have to draw on to build these palatial complexes? That's one part, and the other part is, who did he use as laborers? Were they fairly paid? Were they foreign, bringing styles from the Mediterranean? That's a fantastic question. So the question for those of you that didn't hear it is, <laughs> where did Harry get all the money to build so much? And who did the building? Let me take the second piece first. Um, we can tell that much of this building must have been by local masons and craftspeople, and I'll tell you why. Um, the great, I'll give you just one example, the great um, temple to Roman Augustus that Herod builds at Samaria he builds a huge artificial platform, like the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, as a matter of fact. Same idea, same design, huge vaults. Vaults. Vaults, which are best effected by Roman construction techniques, which have been known for 200 years, concrete and facings. But they aren't built of concrete and facings. They're built of ashlers, the local stone cut. So that has to be local craftsmen. No Roman would do that. That is a complete waste of energy. But there are a few, a few instances, just a few, the harbor at Caesarea, the harbor itself, not the rest of the city, and then one or two other places where Roman concrete is used. Now nobody in Judea would have known how to do it. So there had to have been a few um, craftspeople that 
Herod, you know, hired. He hired in from Rome. The money, there were taxes. There were taxes and they, you know, Karen pointed out eloquently, when we focus on real people, when we look down and we see their houses, and we see another stratum in a way of, of this world. But there's a piece that we never, um, we hardly ever talk about. Uh, most of those people were not, it's not that they weren't rich, it's that they worked for somebody. They didn't own their, they were peasants. They were kind of serf-like. They didn't own, it wasn't a whole bunch of happy independent farmers. These people supplied all the food for the priests in Jerusalem who didn't have to work. We know this from Josephus. So all those farmsteads and oil presses and wine installations out in the countryside, those people are just working for the man. And one of those men is Herod. So in addition to taxes from the wealthy, there is just the results of work from these people. Um, who we'll see more of next week. <laughs> and on, on that note, uh, I invite all of you to linger with further questions for the speaker. There's some refreshments still outside. And of course, to invite you back not only next week, but also tomorrow for a longer presentation from Professor Sternum. Professor Berlin, thank you very much.